We rise up as we pray together. Almighty God, we thank you for the Bible story tonight. We bless your name for bringing us together. Thank you, Lord, for what you're teaching us and what you've been teaching us before. We pray, Lord, that your word will bear fruit in every life in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for such a church, studying your word, not only being hearers of the word, but doers of the word. We well, thank you for the grace you've given us. Thank you for the lives we live. And thank you, Lord, for the impact of the word in our lives. We we'll pray, Lord, that this impact will continue to grow in every life in Jesus' name. We we'll pray, Lord, that you grant us that commitment to the obedience of your word. Now, whatever it is you're teaching us, we'll go ahead and commit ourselves and submit ourselves to the obedience of that word and the obedience will bear more fruit in the kingdom in Jesus' name. Amen. Once again, Lord, teach us because we, your children, are here. And the grace to do and to be what you want us to do and to be, we will have. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. We're looking at 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. We're looking at verses 1 and 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Verses 1 and 2. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free cause and be glorified even as it is with you, that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith. Here we find Paul, the apostle, once again, is now concluding the epistle. That's why it says, finally, brethren. He's spoken about quite a lot of things. Number one, he's spoken about the conversion of the people. And his sustaining grace in the lives of the people. He's spoken about the obedience to the word of God. He's spoken about the evangelism and the reaching out of those people. Unto their neighbors, unto the people around them. And the word has gone beyond their locality to their community. And also to the zone in which they abode, in which they lived. Not only that, to the local governments and what we can call regions and states today. Because it went beyond their local territory and went to the people that were in other cities as well. And Paul, the apostle, have been so much impressed about the life of Christ and the life of righteousness in this church. And now he wants to finalize everything. He's taught them fellowship and doctrine and lifestyle and practical issues in the kingdom of God. But now he says, finally, and he says, brethren. I'm sure if you've been studying with us, you know that many, many times you see the word brethren. These were saved people. These were converted people. These were men and women in Christ. And Paul the Apostle said in another place that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. That newness of life and that newness of behavior, that newness of character you saw in them. And he never stopped calling them brethren. I told you before in the last study that in every chapter of the first of first uh, Thessalonians and every chapter of second Thessalonians, I just said brethren, brethren, brethren all the time say people, steadfast people there were people that started with the Lord in conversion and they continued and if you are a brother like that a sister like that the joy is that you were born again and then you are continuing steadfastly in the Lord not only they were saved and steadfast they were also spiritual these were not carnal people these were not fleshly people these were not people that were just wishy-washy superficial people they were people that actually went into the world believed in the word they accepted the word as the apostle had taught them and they lived by the word and so you find these uh, spiritual people being referred to as brethren finally brethren these were people who are sanctified and separated from the world because they were even persecuted. If you go back to first Thessalonians, it says in chapter 2, you have been persecuted severely. Like all the other people were persecuted. Why? Because they were not of the world, even as Christ was not of the world. Separated people, sanctified people. He had prayed for them that the Lord will sanctify them spirit, soul, and body. And 
day was comfort because we see the growth in faith and the growth in love and the growth in charity and the interaction with each other. And Paul, the apostle, said, you know, the joy I'm having concerning you is that when you receive the word of God, you receive it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which worketh mightily and effectively, effectually in you. That's why he now says, finally, brethren, pray for us. Now, if you know Paul the Apostle, Paul the Apostle was a man of prayer himself, an apostle of prayer, a praying apostle. Because you see that uh, he started his Christian life by praying. Because we are told he prayed. He prayed. And now, because he's been praying, he now says, pray for us. He knew the value of prayer, the weight of prayer, the effectiveness of prayer, the power, the strength in prayer. Prayer was the lifeline of the life of the Apostle Paul and of the ministry of the Apostle Paul. Nobody knew the impotence, the powerlessness, and the weakness of man's talent or man's knowledge or man's skill or man's cultural strength without God's enablement as Paul the Apostle did. That's why I said pray for us. He was asking for prayer for himself and also for his companions. The source of his spiritual strength, spiritual strength and success was prayer and faith and total dependence on God. His Christian life began in prayer, seeking the face of the Lord. His life was transformed by grace and that grace he obtained by prayer. And constant trust in God. His ministry was supported and sustained and saturated with unceasing prayer. As you look at all the all the things we read about Paul the Apostle, from the Acts of the Apostles to the Epistles of Romans and Corinthians and Galatians and all the epistles he wrote, you are going to find a summary of this that he prayed in the house, he prayed in the church, he prayed in the prison, he prayed in the shore, he prayed everywhere, he prayed night and day, he prayed in the temple, he prayed everywhere, he prayed for the church, he prayed for himself. He prayed for everybody. He prayed for the sinners too. He prayed for Israel. Israel, the nation of his own and forefathers that had not given themselves to the Lord. He prayed and prayed and prayed every time and everywhere. And now, even after he had prayed, he said, pray for us. This was a man, an apostle, that realized that Jesus was praying for him, the mighty intercessor, who at the right hand of God was interceding for him. This was the man that told the Roman people, he said, I know the Holy Ghost is making intercession for you and for me and for us all together and yet with the intercession of Christ and intercession of the Holy Ghost and then he soon prayer as well he still said I need more prayer cannot be too much pray for us and that's why we're looking at this today you also see the request was making about the prayer the prayer of God's people for their pastors if Paul the apostle as great as it was requested for prayer our local pastors are asking for prayer our group pastors are asking for prayer. Our state and region of us, yes, and national of us, yes, are asking for prayer. Our leaders and workers, apart from pastors, those who are working in various sections of work, they say, yes, we're doing our best. We're sacrificing everything we can sacrifice. And we want to commit everything we have to the Lord, like Paul the Apostle. But all the same, the church must keep on praying for their leaders. The church must keep on praying for their pastors, for the workers, for the ministers. And it is as we do that, their ministry will be effective in our lives it will be in jesus name and that's the reason why the church has been strong your local church has been strong your group church has been strong and your regional church or state church or national church has been strong because of prayer and i pray that the good thing we've been doing will keep on doing it in jesus name we're looking at this a study on three perspectives number one paul's demand he demanded it and this was not something he just suggested would you please pray for me if, if you think it's all right is it all right to pray for me he said no pray for us he demanded it paul's demand number two is a passionate desire he had a desire there was a reason he was asking for the prayer and the reason he tells us in that verse one that the word of god may have free course among the people we're preaching to just as the word of god has had free course among you he said i want every church of the gentle world to be like yours the Thessalonian church i want them saved i want them steadfast i want them spiritual i want them separated i want them sanctified i want them spirit filled that's why he was asking for the prayer that the word of god was preaching to them and to all the other people we have the mighty effect that's the reason we're asking for prayer too that our preaching will be effective that our singing will be effective that our ministration to you will be effective that our transmission to you will be effective that everything 
everything we're doing, that our ushering, that our security, that all the work we're doing among the children church and the youth church and the campus church and the work we're doing in the adult church, that everything will be effective. We depend upon your prayer like Paul the Apostle depended on the prayers of the people. And I'm sure you are going to continue to pray for your leaders and as we pray for our leaders, God will make them more mightily effective in Jesus' name a passionate desire then you have number three he spoke about uh, the people that oppose the gospel the people that oppose the going on and the flowing out of the power of the gospel that's why he spoke about these uh, persecutors perverse persecutors the people that cause pain to the people of God, to the preachers of the gospel. And he said, yes, I know. God has given us the promise that he'll deliver us. But the children of God will need to bring that promise into fulfillment. The promise deliverance from morally perverse persecutors and people. We come to act to number one. Paul's demand for the members prevailing prayer. I want you to come back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 1. Finally, brethren, pray for us. It's like saying, I cannot conclude this epistle without asking pray for us. I've said a lot of things that will be enough to take you to heaven, but then this is final. This has to come into it. Brethren, pray for us. He had confidence because he was talking to brethren. He was talking to the church. He was talking to the people of God. You know, when you are talking to unbelievers, you really don't know whether they're going to accept or they're not going to accept. You're pleading with them. You're reasoning with them. And you're praying for them. And you're telling them this, but you cannot be sure whether they're going to listen or not. But when you are talking to the brethren, how you spoke confidently to them, how you spoke with great expectation to them. And he said, brethren, I can talk to you. You know already the power of our ministry in your life. I can ask you this because I know that what has come to you, you want it to get to other people. So I can confidently demand this of you. Pray for us. The great apostle and his companions requested for the prayer of the brethren. The brethren can contribute much to the success of the ministry. There are times when we leave our local pastors alone and say, well, he has been appointed as pastor and if he has been appointed, he has the anointing. Let him go ahead and do it. No, Paul the apostle too was called of God, commissioned by God, appointed and anointed and yet he said the appointment will not fulfill its ultimate goal if the church does not pray pray for your local pastor pray for the group pastors and pray for our overseers because even though by the grace of God they are qualified they are equipped they are trained and by the grace of God uh, they know the scriptures but all the scriptures they know like Paul the apostle will not be effective at all if we do not pray for them you see we do more criticism than praying if any local pastor makes a mistake we're quick to point it out if anybody kind of, you know, maybe a slip of tongue, he says something, we're quick to point it out. But he says, don't criticize the pastors, but pray for them. Pray for us, he said. I pray that we'll change from criticism to praying in Jesus' name. No more mourning against our leaders and no complaint against our leaders, no criticism against our leaders. All we're going to do is, what are we going to do? We're going to pray. And as we pray, God will answer your prayers in Jesus' name. You know, sometimes I will say, we should have done this, we should have done this. That's another way of complaining. We should have gone this way and should have gone that way. That's another way of complaining. We should have, we should have gone and tell the Lord and pray for those leaders. Make them more effective, make them more powerful, make them more confident, make them more trusting, and make them more powerful in the things of the Lord. And as we pray, God is going to answer the prayer. If you will devote this week as we look at this, and we're not only hearers of the word, we're to us of the word. If you will look at this and this week, you know, when you're at the table and then, you know, you want to eat, just remember that. Take that time. Just say a word of prayer for a local pastor. And then when you're having your quiet time in the family, say a word of prayer for a local pastor. And then for all the other leaders in the church too, the people that are contributing to our spiritual growth. If you do that from today till Saturday till Sunday morning, when you come to church next Sunday, you're going to find a change. 
that there's going to be an added anointing, added power, added penetration of the word of God. If you promise to do that and do it faithfully, test the Lord. The Lord says, taste and see that the Lord is good. You are going to say that the administration to you is going to be more effective in Jesus' name. You see, it was the praying of the people that will create impact for the preaching of the gospel. Thus, both the preachers and the brethren can share the responsibility of ministry together as the preacher is preaching and then the people are praying and then you join that together what an effect it will be knowing the power of the believers prayer of faith the apostle paul humbly asked for their prayers it was a great privilege for the brethren too to pray for him what a great thing when you get to heaven and the lord is giving out rewards and he says all the rewards i'm going to give to paul the apostle is not only for him but the people that prayed for him the people that prayed that you know he will evangelize more effectively he will develop and edify the church more effectively he will reach out to the unrich more effectively and then as the lord is giving reward to the apostle paul he says you have this to you have this to you all those people that were born again that were converted your contribution was there too the same thing in the present day all that our leaders are doing great great work for the lord and great effectiveness in the kingdom of god when they are going to have the reward you share the reward in jesus name our Lord Jesus Christ himself even once asked three of his disciples to pray with him in his hour of great trial and sorrow seeking strength to face the cross for the salvation of the whole world and also remember in the case of Peter the apostle the whole church gathered together and they prayed for him and when they prayed God answered in a miraculous supernatural way why because the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man of the righteous brethren of a righteous church availeth much that's why paul the apostle said brethren pray for us you will pray Amen. i said you will pray Amen. i'm sure you understand you are not leaving this place and then in the evening in the night before you sleep you kneel and say oh lord i read the word of god today so paul the apostle said pray for us i'm praying for paul now i'm praying for timothy now is that what to do because if you pray for Paul, now what's your prayer going to do? Paul is in heaven already. If you pray for Timothy and Titus, now what's the prayer going to do? If they're in heaven already, what is teaching us is that your own Paul, your own Timothy, your own Titus, the people that are ministering to you today, the one that is standing before you and is saying this and the way what he therein and is doing the word of salvation, of sanctification, of the Holy Ghost baptism, of how to make your life straight and how to help you so that you'll be strong in the Lord. It says that pastor that you see every time your local church that is the person you have to love him you have to pray for him that's your paul and the lord will give us the grace to do that in jesus name we're looking at romans chapter 15 verse 30 romans chapter 15 we're looking at verse 30 it says now i beseech you brethren for the lord jesus christ's sake and for the love of the spirit that she strive together with me your prayers to god for me your prayers together striving together with me pray for me unto god you see what was saying look at verse 31 that i may be delivered from them that do not believe in judea you see everywhere he went there was opposition opposition to the gospel opposition to the preaching of the word of god that he brought to them and then he said because of that you know you know paul the apostle they stoned him he got up again and continued to preach he said that man was strong strengthened by the prayer of the people he said i've been in shipwreck i've been here i've been there said, that man i wish i was strong like him because of the prayer of the people you show me a pastor that jesus is praying for him holy ghost praying for him interceding for him and then he himself is praying and then the whole church the church in rome and the church at corinth and the church at Colossae and the church at philippa the church all the other places pray for him that pastor will be strong i said that pastor will be strong i want that's an encouragement for us that you know you are not alone as a pastor you're not an isolated person and then some people they are afraid to be a pastor i cannot be a pastor because the challenges might be too great for me the way i am i'm all right so
so that I can face whatever challenges I want to face on my own. But you become a pastor, you are pastor a hundred people, two hundred people, a thousand people, and then you have this challenge, this challenge. I don't think I can do that. Yes, I understand. In your own strength, you cannot do it. In the strength of the Lord, you will do it in Jesus' name. You see, when you become a pastor, you become special. When you become a preacher, you become special. So, don't dodge the responsibility because as you come into the ministry, whatever the challenges are, as your day, so will be your strength. As your responsibility, so will you will be your strength. And when all those churches are praying for you, whatever wicked people, whatever persecutors are around you, God will help you, will sustain you, you will not fall in Jesus' name. It says in verse 31 that I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea, and that my service which I have for Jerusalem may be accepted of the saints. Your service will be affected in Jesus' name. In Ephesians chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 18. After the Paul, the apostle, had told them, put on the whole armor of God. He was telling the whole church, he said, young and old, put on the whole armor of God. And men and women, put on the whole armor of God and be strong in the Lord. After they became strong in the Lord, you see what he said in verse 18. He said, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all sins and for me and for me and for me it wasn't talking to weakened brethren it wasn't talking to backsliding brethren it wasn't talking to people that didn't know how to really be strong in the lord already after they became strong and they were able to stand against all the wiles of the evil one he said now in that strength and in that armor there's something you are going to do don't use all the armor for yourself you're going to pray for me that utterance may be given unto me that i may open my mouth boldly and to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am I am an ambassador in bonds and that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. I pray God will help us in Jesus name. You see Paul the apostle knew the value of prayer he knew the importance and the potency of prayer. That's why I was saying pray for me, pray for us you know your leaders and your pastors and as we do that in obedience to the word of the Lord what great conquest we are going to have in Jesus name. Paul's request for the believer's intercession was not only to the Thessalonian church. He also made the same request to the churches at Rome and the churches at Ephesus and the churches at Colossae and the churches in all the other places. He had no confidence in the flesh. His hope of success in ministry and victory, in trials and in persecutions, all that was not in his own strength or natural gifts. He was conscious of the intercession that Christ was making for him already and yet he said, I need the prayer of the church of the living God and as we will say the same thing today we say Paul the apostle a great apostle strong up mighty apostle if you need the prayer of the people of God those of us who are serving the Lord today in any capacity and every capacity we need that same prayer and as you pray for us God will strengthen us more and more in Jesus name we're looking at Colossians chapter 4 verse 2 Colossians chapter 4 verse 2 continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving he said don't say well we were prayed for a local pastor last time a group pastor the other time and we pray for all those our leaders in the choir in the every section and ushers and all that you know because we're all ministers of God it's not only those of us that stand at the pulpit all of us we're ministering to you and it has it is a united ministry that is making the church strong and so that's why you know Paul the apostle pray for us he didn't just say pray for me but pray for us all of us are important in ministry in your life and in your development and growth therefore your prayers for every one of us look at it in verse 3 it says without praying also for us praying also for us you know there are some people they think once they pray for you know the one that is preaching the word they've done everything no it's everyone that is ministering to us and when you see those workers and those leaders and those ministers and they come to us and they minister to us that they are part of the us here it says without praying also for us that god will open unto us a door of utterance 
to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds, and that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. I pray God will help us. It says to make the mystery of the gospel, which is hidden before people, because it's hidden to them, they cannot understand. And we're to open their eyes to behold the glory of the Lord, the goodness of the Lord, and the power, the effect of the gospel in their lives. That's why it says, I need prayer for this, so that I'll simplify the hard subjects. I'll be able to make it very clear and very plain, and then it will be understandable to everybody. And as they understand it, the conviction of the Holy Ghost will come upon them, and they'll run to the Lord, saying, Oh Lord, save us who have sinned. And then they come all to the Lord in mass, and they are being converted, and they are entering to the kingdom of God. He said, that cannot happen, except you continually and persistently, importunately continue to pray for us. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 25, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 25, it says, in verse 25, brethren, pray for us. Brethren, pray for us. You know, sinners will not pray for us, even if they prayed for us, the prayer will not be answered. Unbelievers will not pray for us. Even if we prayed, their prayers will not be answered. Those church goers, religious people, will not pray for us. Even if they prayed, because they abandon the word of God, they neglect the word of God. And the Lord, the Lord has said that because you have rejected knowledge, I also have rejected you. They cannot pray for us and have any effect. All those religious people who cannot send prayer requests to them because they cannot pray for us. Even if they did, it will not be effective. They have to be brethren. They have to be saved. They have to be children of God. They have to be abiding believers. They have to be people who are separated from the world. And they have to be righteous people. Because it's only the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man, a righteous woman, a righteous church that availeth much. That's why he always says, brethren. He says, brethren, pray for us. And you remain a real child of God. Your prayer is mighty. Your prayer is wonderful. And your prayer will be effective in the lives of all our leaders in Jesus' name. It's saying in Philemon, Philemon chapter 1, only one chapter, Philemon chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. Having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou wilt also do more than I say. Now he said, after he said, I'm sure of your obedience. I, I'm sure you're not just a church goer, Philemon. I'm sure you're not a superficial fellow. The people that hear a lot, but they do nothing about it. I'm sure about your obedience, because you have the grace of God to be obedient to the Lord. And after he had said that, he then said in verse 22, but with thou prepare me also a lodging, for I trust that through your prayers, through your prayers I shall be given unto you. Through your prayers I shall be given unto you. Through your prayers I shall be given unto you. Uh, can we stop there for a moment and think about this? Through your prayers I Paul, the apostle, shall be given unto you. Through your prayers I Pastor Paul will be given unto you. Through your prayers, I, Evangelist Paul, will be given unto you. You know, there are people, instead of praying, they complain. Instead of seeking the face of the Lord, all they do is complain. And all they say is, you know, uh, local uh, pastor, we don't know what has happened. What's he doing? He's not always in church every Sunday. Is he going for extramoral studies? Is he going for this and that? Well, we don't know what's happening to him. They only complain. They don't pray. Through your prayers, I shall be given unto you. We don't know what's happening to our women leader because, you know, we hear that in that other district, you know, they're having women program, they're having this and that. In that other group, they're having this and that. We don't know what's happening to our women leader. Through your prayers, I shall be given unto you. It's not through your complaints, through your criticism, writing to the rep in the old district or writing to the, you know, region of Asia or state of Asia. We don't know what's happening here, what's happening there. Through your prayers, I shall be given unto you. You know, the other time when the choir sang, I don't know how this one went. Complaining, complaining. Through your prayers, the administration shall be given unto you. You know, if we change, and there's no more criticism. If we change, there's no more complaint. If we change, there's no more conflict. If we change, and we're not throwing stones at those who are missing, they're 
doing their best. And if their best is not reaching us very well, it says, through your prayers, I shall be given unto you. And you know, there are some people, the only thing they do is they write. Sometimes they say, well, pastor, referring to me, we're expecting in our state, and then we're expecting in our region. And then what's the pastor do? We can't find him. And you know, we just see him on the screen. Through your prayers, I shall be given unto you. You know, if we stop all the complaining, all the criticism, and we stop, you know, what's he doing? Where is he? Where is he? See not through your prayers. Paul the apostle said, You know what you do? If you want me to come to where you are, and if you want me to be released, I'll be released in the spirit and released in the natural and released in every way possible. And then I'll come to you. He says, You know what you're going to do through your prayers? I shall be released unto you. God answers prayer. I say, God answers prayer. And so if you really need the ministry of those pastors and those evangelists and those overseers, it is through prayer. Not by complaint, not by writing petition letters. And you through your prayers, I shall be given unto you. You know, there are times in our church that, you know, we say that, you know, that pastor was a wonderful pastor. I wish that this pastor was still our pastor. I don't know why they took this pastor away from here. They put him over here. We just love that pastor. That pastor is great and wonderful. He has a pastor's heart. Through your prayers I shall be given unto you. It is not through. Why did this happen? Why did they take this pastor away from here to this place and this one away from here and to this? Through your prayers I shall be given unto you. The things that we cannot achieve by complaining and the things we cannot have by you know slander or whatever we can have by prayer. God will answer your prayer. I say God will answer your prayer. The Lord is showing us that what we cannot have in the natural and the normal way when we pray, God knows our heart. He knows all we want. It's not because we are selfish. We just want a Paul the Apostle to come around and have some impact in our lives and increase spiritual gifts in our lives. And he says, if that is your desire, we're going to have it in Jesus' name. Through your prayers, I shall be given unto you. Give me a good amen. amen. We're looking at Hebrews now. Hebrews chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 18. Hebrews chapter 13. We're looking at verse 18. In Hebrews chapter 13 verse 18. We're still, uh, you know, hammering the same thing. In verse 18 it says, verse 18, pray for us. This Paul the apostle is wonderful. You know, he wasn't a selfish. He wasn't just pray for me, pray for me, pray for me. You know, there are some people, once they pray for me, that's all right. If I'm effective and all the other preachers are not effective, that's not my concern. That's not a sanctified life. That's not a sanctified person. A sanctified person, I want to be effective. I want my brother there to be effective. I want to be effective. I want my sister there to be effective. And therefore, it is not a selfish kind of demand, a selfish kind of request. Pray for me, pray for me, pray for me. I want to evangelize the whole world. I want to push everybody away. Nobody else is useful. Nobody else knows anything. I am the only one and the big shot that can evangelize the whole world. Well, no, it's all of us together. That's why Paul the apostle said, I need prayer, she needs prayer, he needs prayer, all of us. We need prayer, therefore, pray for us, for we trust that we have a good conscience in all things and willing to labor honestly. In verse 19, but I beseech you, the rather, to do this that I may be restored to you the sooner. You see that? He said, if I've not been restored unto you, if you have not seen me in your locality, if I've not come, maybe you're not praying enough because if you pray, then I will be restored unto you and God will strengthen his church in Jesus' name. Acts of the Apostles chapter 12, we're reading from verse 5. Acts of the Apostles chapter 12, we're reading from verse 5. It says, Peter therefore was cared in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. Prayer was made unto God without ceasing for Peter the apostle. You know the miracle that happened? God sent an angel from heaven. You know, they were just praying in what we call a house church, in the house of the mother of John Mark. And those people there that were praying, just praying in the day and praying, not without ceasing, they said nothing must happen to Peter. 
Peter is in the prison now. We don't have any political power. We cannot lobby. We cannot go to this uh, senator or go to that house of rep and say release uh, this man. See what Peter is going through. And then Herod is saying, I'm going to kill that man. Oh Lord, deliver this man. Deliver him. We need him. Through your prayers, I, I shall be restored unto you. An angel came from heaven. And then the doors opened. And then he came out. And then when he was in, he said, Thank God because God has released me. And what was responsible for that release? The prayer of the people of God. And he knew. That's why I went to the house of the mother of John Mark. Where they were praying. He knocked at the door. Knocked at the door. Eventually they opened it and they were all glad. You will be glad. When you see the answer to your prayer, when you see the response to your prayer, and when you see that all the persecutions we are hearing about, you know some people, they just read about it, they say, you know, that pastor in that place, they are facing this and they are facing that, the challenges are there. Why don't they run away from there? No, they will not run away from there. Through our prayers, God will protect them from all harm in Jesus' name. We're looking at point number two now. You see, Paul, the apostle said, pray for us, but he gave the reason. Second Thessalonians chapter 3. Second Thessalonians chapter 3. I'm reading there from verse 1. Again, we need to look at this second part of verse 1. Second Thessalonians. We're looking at chapter 3, verse 1. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course. That's the purpose of the prayer. That's the reason for the prayer. That the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you. And be glorified. The word of God to be glorified. Unbelievers will not be glorified. Our persecutors will not be glorified. It is the word of the Lord that will be glorified in Jesus' name. And you know, he said something. He said, as the word of God has been effective and glorified in your midst, so I want that same word of God to be effective and glorified in all the other places I go. And it is going to happen through your prayer. First Thessalonians chapter 1. Let's say how the word of God was effective in their lives and glorified in their lives and had free cause in their lives. And the same thing Paul the Apostle was asking for in all the other churches and they said it will happen when the people of God the brethren, the church, when they pray for him. We're looking at 1st Thessalonians chapter 1, reading from verse 5. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance as she know what manner of men we were among you for your sakes and ye became followers of us and of the Lord and that's how the word of God was glorified in their midst and he said I'm praying for this and I want you to join me in prayer and pray for us so that everywhere we go and we'll preach the word of God it will have the same effect leading them to conviction the same effect leading them to conversion the same effect will conquer the hardness of their hearts and it says it had this effect on ye became followers of us and of the Lord having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost so that ye were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. He said that's the same effect you want this word to have everywhere we go. That's why he's saying pray for us so that the word of God will have free cause. It will get straight into their heart, penetrate their heart heart and then slay the enmity against the word of God in their heart. They will bow the knee and bend their soul before the Lord and they will submit and surrender unto the Lord. Look at it in verse 8 for from you sounded out out the word of the Lord not only in Macedonia and Achaia but also in every place your faith to God word is spread abroad so that we need not speak anything he said that's how the word of God worked effectually in you that's the same thing we want the word of God to do everywhere we go that's why I was saying pray for us so that the word of God will have the same free cause all hindrances will be taken away all bottlenecks will be taken away all things that will be the clog in the the wheel of progress will be taken away but the word will have free course, will flow freely, will convert the hearts of the people. Look at verse 9. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we add unto you and how ye turned to 
God from idols to serve the living and true God. You turn from idols and you're serving the true God now. And we're going to all the idol worshippers and all those other idol worshippers when they hear the word of God, want the word of God to have this free effect on them, this mighty effect on them, and this glorious effect on them, so that whatever idolatry they're into, whatever darkness they're into, whatever evil they're into, they will turn just like you have turned and they will come to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son in verse 10 from heaven whom he raised from the dead even Jesus which delivered us from the wrath to come. You have been delivered want the others to be delivered that's why we're asking pray for us. Let's come to chapter 2 of this First Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 1 for yourselves brethren know our entrance in unto you that it was not in vain it was not in vain it said you know the soil went forth to sow and then on the first land it was in vain on the second land it was stony ground it was in vain on the other rocky place it was in vain but on the fourth one it brought forth 30 fold and 60 fold and 100 fold it said that one was not in vain the same thing with you you are not the wayside land you are not the stony ground you are not the rocky land you are not the place filled with thorns and teasers you are the ground that is bringing forth fruit 30 fold and 60 fold and 100 fold and we want the word of God to be like that in every other place. You know our gathering unto you, our entrance unto you, that it was not in vain. Look at verse 13 of that chapter 2. It says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. It worked in them in the past, and till that time Paul the apostle was writing, it was still working, effectually worketh and walking and walking keeps on walking in their heart he said it's the same result we want to see everywhere we go he was looking at the Thessalonians church as a model church as a church obedient to the word of God as a church submissive to the authority of the Lord and he said we we'll want to see that reproduced in every other place we go that's why I was saying pray for us so that there will be the penetrating power of the message of the word in the hearts and the lives of the people I pray it will happen in Jesus name Acts of the Apostles chapter 2 I'm reading from verse 37 when those people had the word of God see how the word of God had free flow Said the word of God was glorified. Said the word of God was magnified. Said the word of God broke down their enmity. Said the word of God pricked them and kind of pinched them and kind of led them to the cross to give their lives to the Lord. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, verse 37. Now, when they had had this, they were pricked in their heart. And they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? That's the effect Paul the apostle was asking for that if we preach the word of God and then we preach so effectively and we preach so powerfully, so that the word of God will have a free flow and there will be no hindrance at all, the blindness of their heart, of their eyes will be taken away. And then they will be asking, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Look at verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent. He said, this is what you have to do. You have to repent. And the people did not say, uh -uh, we are not ready to repent. They just repented. That's the word of God having free flow. And then it goes on to say, verse 40, and with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, save yourselves from this unto what generation. And they that gladly, what did they do? Received his word. That's the word having free flow. That's what having free cause. That's what being glorified and magnified in their hearts. And that's what Paul the Apostle was saying. Let the word of God be received. And your prayer can do it. You see, Paul the Apostle, you know, the gospel that Paul the Apostle preached, he said, I didn't receive this from man. I received it from God. He was preaching sound doctrine. But the sound doctrine without your prayer will not be effective enough. He was preaching the true gospel. He said, but the true gospel without your prayer will not be effective enough. He was not corrupting the word of God as many other people do. He was preaching the incorruptible word of God. But he said the incorruptible word will not have the power defect except through your prayer. That means then, although we are preaching sound doctrine, we are preaching the sound gospel, 
the saving gospel, the life transforming gospel, but that is not enough. We must join that with prayer. The preaching of the true gospel needs the reciprocal power of prayer to make it effective. Proclaiming the soul saving gospel, proclaiming the life transforming gospel, preaching the powerful word of God faithfully and forcefully still requires the supernatural power of the Holy Ghost to convict people, to conquer their hearts, and to convert those hearts of men. The careful presentation of the word with the wisdom in communication and zealous, passionate preaching with the best of fervor and desirable intentions are not enough to lead or keep souls in the kingdom without our praying to secure divine penetrating power of the word. That's why preaching and prayer must go together if we hope to reap an enduring harvest of souls into the everlasting kingdom. Our preaching must be burst in prayer, blessed with prayer, baptized in prayer if we expect a revival of righteousness in the church and of repentance in the world. Let's look at Acts of the Apostles chapter 17. Acts of the Apostles chapter 17. When we pray pray or the preaching of the word, it will have a mighty effect in the hearts of the people. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 17 verse 1, now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. And some of them believed, and some of them believe. Why? Because the word had free cause in their hearts and because there were people that were praying. You see, when the preacher is preaching and then the prayer warriors are praying and you join that together there's going to be power. There's going to be supernatural penetration of the word. And it says, and they consulted they agreed, they joined, they affiliated with Paul and Silas and of the devout Greeks and a great multitude and of the chief women not a few. That's the effect of the praying the people did for their pastor, for their apostle, for Paul the apostle, and the word of God had a mighty effect. That's of the apostles chapter 15 verse 3. Acts chapter 15 we're reading from verse 3. And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles. The conversion of the Gentiles. The preaching of the word resulted in the conversion of those idol worshippers, those pagans, those superstitious people, those traditional people, and those, uh, you know, jungle people. The power of the Lord walked mightily in their heart because the word of God penetrated them. The word of God convicted them. The word of God turned them away from all their sin, all their evil, all their immorality and then turned them unto the Lord and they were converted unto the Lord. That's a great mighty change, a transformation in their lives, a cleansing, a transformation and a purifying. He said the conversion of the Gentiles and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. Let's come to point number three. In point number three, we're looking at the promised deliverance from morally perverse persecutors. Paul the apostle said, pray for us brethren, that the word of God, the word of the Lord may have free course and have free flow in the midst of the people and be glorified even as it is with you. Why? And that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. That we, the preachers, may be delivered. That we, the workers, may be delivered. You know, when we talk about uh, persecution, it's not only the apostle that was persecuted. Timothy was persecuted. Titus was persecuted. And the other people, too, that were companions, they were persecuted. That's what we're saying. That it's not only the local pastor in the church that is persecuted for righteousness' sake. All the other workers along with him, those who are supporting him, those who are contributing to the growth of the ministry, we all experience the persecution together. So the prayer is not only for Paul, it's for all of us together that we, you see that, it's not just that me, my, myself, that I may be delivered in verse 2, that we, Paul, 
his companions, the workers, and the ministers around him may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men for all men have not faith. Why are they persecuting us? Because they don't have faith. They don't believe. That's why they're persecuting us. But we thank the Lord for Paul the Apostle and for all those companions. Whatever the persecution, they were still effective. Whatever you are going through, you'll be effective in Jesus' name. You see, Paul's persecutors were relentless. They were reasonable. His adversaries were wicked and devilish, yet he labored so much more than any other apostle. That's why you cannot say, because of the difficulties going on in our region, difficulties going on in our state, didn't you hear? Have you not read about what is happening over here in our place? Yes, we're here, but we're praying for you, and our prayer will be stronger than all those difficulties you have in Jesus' name. So that's why the church ought to pray. We have the ministers who are in difficult situations, ministers who are in difficult terrain, in difficult regions and states and local governments where this happening, that's happening, that's happening, but by the grace of God, our prayers will strengthen them. Our prayers will energize them and will protect them. No evil will happen to them in Jesus' name. And when all this, um, you know, whatever, when it has come and gone, our preachers, our pastors who are in those places, they'll still remain strong and standing in Jesus' name. Because we are praying for them. Because the gospel must keep on being preached unto all people. Because Jesus is going into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. It doesn't say preach the gospel in easy places. In comfortable places, in convenient places, in places that are calm, in places where there's no problem at all. Everywhere, go preach the gospel to every creature. And we thank God for faithful pastors in our church or in those difficult areas and in those challenging areas. And as challenging as those places are, we're praying for them and our prayers will work. Amen. Protection for them. Amen. Preservation for them. Amen effective and mighty power of the Holy Ghost in their lives in Jesus name they will be stronger than they were before and as we join hands and join our hearts together and we obey this commandment of the Lord through the apostle that we pray for these our preachers in difficult places they will be mightily effective in Jesus name while those challenges are going on conversions will be going on healings will be going on deliverances will be going on and the joy of the Lord will be their strength in Jesus' name. You see, we have been promised the deliverance. And the promise is going to be fulfilled in Jesus' name. You see, Paul the Apostle, he was buffeted by Satan. You see, that Paul, principalities and powers wrestled against him. That Paul the Apostle, the Jews conspired to kill him. The Gentiles stoned him and false brethren slandered him. Sinners and unbelievers imprisoned him. The seas roared and raged against him. Associates and churches forsook him and disappointed him yet he preached and spread the gospel through the then known world the lord delivered him from the unreasonable and wicked men through his uh, prayer and the prayers of other people as well now as we talk about this it's not only preachers who are persecuted and some of us who are believers you have come to know the lord you're a new convert and then maybe people around you say what is this this is not going to happen you're not going to remain in that please you're not going to keep on going to that church don't worry about that we are praying for you our first will be praying for you the zoo will be praying for you and all the believers around you praying for you those new converts they will stand in jesus name you see unreasonable men and wicked men they may persecute but their persecution will not weaken the converts it will strengthen those converts in jesus name look at paul the apostle he tells us in acts of the apostles chapter 26 Acts chapter 26. I'm reading from verse 16. Acts chapter 26. We're looking at here from verse 16. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. There is a purpose for which you are called into ministry. God has a purpose in your life. I said he has a purpose in your life. He had a purpose in the life of Paul the Apostle. 
and that purpose will be fulfilled that's why i said pray for us pray for us so that the purpose god has for paul for timothy for titus and for you and for me and for all our pastors and workers the purpose for which you came into the kingdom the lord will fulfill it in jesus name he says to make thee a minister and a witness of both of those things which thou hast seen and of those things in the which i will appear unto thee delivering thee from the people that promise had been given delivering thee from the people the fulfillment of that promise will be based on the prayer that we pray we pray for ourselves and we pray for other people and then from the gentiles unto whom i now send thee to open their eyes their eyes will be open to turn them from darkness unto light and from the power of satan unto god that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me and that's the promise of the lord and this promise will fulfilled in the life of paul the apostle it will be fulfilled in our lives i believe that from today all our pastors will be stronger in jesus name from today, all our women leaders will be stronger in Jesus' name. All our workers in every section will be stronger in Jesus' name. And you too saying it, amen. Your own life will be stronger in Jesus' name. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, look at verse 18. And the Lord shall deliver me. Can you say that? Say that again. It will happen. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. amen. There is an amen in your life. Amen. And you'll be strong, stronger and stronger in Jesus' name. In Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 17. Jeremiah chapter 1. We're reading from verse 17. Thou therefore gather up thy loins, and arise and speak unto them all that I command thee. Be not dismayed at their faces, lest I confound thee before them. For behold, I have made thee this day a defense city, and an iron pillar, and brazen walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, and against the princes thereof, and against uh, the priests thereof, and against the people of the land. They shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee. For I am with thee, says the Lord, to deliver thee. God will deliver you. He has delivered you already. Every Paul in our midst, God will deliver them. Every Timothy in our midst, God will deliver them. Every Titus, God will deliver them. Everyone supporting the ministry and making this word of God to reach out to hundreds and thousands and millions of people, God will deliver them. No evil will come upon your life. God will preserve your life to fulfill the ministry as given unto you in Jesus' name. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 54. Isaiah chapter 54 verse 17. No weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. Every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. If you are a servant of the Lord, you have a heritage. You have an inheritance. And the righteousness is of me, says the Lord. No weapon, no persecutor will be able to overcome your life and overthrow your faith. You will be stronger and stronger in Jesus' name. Let's rise up and just rejoice in the Lord. If you're serving the Lord, you're a preacher, you're a pastor, you're an evangelist, you're an overseer, you're a, you're a local pastor, location pastor, group pastor, original pastor, you're serving the Lord or you're serving the Lord with your talent in singing, ushering, or you're, or you're sending the word out to thousands, millions of people uh, through technology, whatever we're doing, the Lord is watching over you. You're a minister, you're a minister, you're, you're a secretary, you're a minister, you're a full-time worker, you're a minister, and the Lord has chosen you specially. You pray for yourself, you pray for other people, and we are praying for you, and the whole church is praying for you. You'll be stronger and stronger. You'll not be weak. 
you will not backslide, you will not look back, and nothing will drive you away from what God has called you to do. You will succeed. This work of God will prosper in your hand. And when you preach the word, and when you send out the word, it will penetrate the hearts of the people. And your reward will be great. I'll see many converts coming to the kingdom of God through your ministry and through our co-preaching together to send this word to the people who reach as yet to every locality, to every community, to every village, and to every city and to every country as we're sending this word the lord will be blessing the word and having free flow having free course in their lives will be glorified in their lives talk to the lord and say lord i thank you i thank you i'm a minister i thank you i'm a child of god I'm, i thank you i'm a servant of the lord i thank you i'm a worker i thank you i'm a minister i thank you this word of god i'm sending forth is not going to be in vain it's going to reach out in the hearts of the people in the lives of the people it will bring conversion it will bring separation from the world it will bring sanctification it will bring spirituality in the lives of the people it will bring strength Tell the Lord, you will not serve in vain. You will not walk in vain. The word of God, God is sending for through you. It's going to be much more effective in the hearts of the people. The Lord is praying for you. The Holy Ghost is interceding for you. And we are praying for you too. And the whole church is praying for you. You will succeed. You will not be defeated. You will not fall. You will not fail. This work of the Lord will prosper in your hand. We are praying. We are praying. And God is answering the prayer. And if you have any personal challenge, any personal difficulty, keep on serving the Lord. Peter was in the prison. The church was praying for him. An angel came from heaven and delivered him. Whatever you are going through, don't give up the work of God because of that. Don't give up the ministry because of that. Don't say, this is too much. Persecution. No, it's not too much. All you need is just for us to pray for you that God will deliver you from those unreasonable and wicked men, those men that do not have faith. God will deliver you from them. As God answered the prayers of the church concerning Peter, miraculous, was delivered out of the prison. God will answer our prayers concerning you. You'll be delivered. You'll not be swallowed up with the over overwhelming tide of the sea that's want to swallow you up take heart the people praying for you you don't know the people you are ministering to you don't know your ministration as the word of god is coming to them through you there are people who are benefiting from your stand from your christian conviction from your life from your ministry you don't know all of them and they're so happy god is using them god is using you in their lives they're praying for you take heart take heart take heart you're not fear you're not fall the whole church is praying you're not like an orphan you're not like helpless fatherless motherless child you're the family of god we're brethren and the factual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The factual fervent prayer of righteous people, righteous church availeth much. You go from faith to faith, from grace to grace, from glory to glory. Recommit yourself to the Lord. Are you ministering, pastoring, shepherding, preaching, evangelizing in a difficult terrain, a difficult place, difficult stage, difficult region, difficult nation? We're praying for you. Be encouraged. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. No weapon that is fashioned against you shall prosper. That's your heritage. Your righteousness is of the Lord. The persecutors might fight against you, but they will not prevail. For the Lord has made you a defense city. Brazen walls as the Lord made you. Be strong. You're strong already. 
looking up to the Lord. The author of the finish of your face he is the one that called you and commissioned you. And he has said, whatever we ask in the name of Jesus concerning you, that he will answer. He has answered already. Be strong, continue in the grace of the Lord.